Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Terry Placek. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a pediatric hospitalist on the children's side, obviously, and I serve as one of the faculty directors of the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement. I also have the pleasure of working for our speaker today. Uh, I'm the Stanford Children's Vice President for uh, Performance Improvement and Associate Chief Quality Officer and Lane Donnelly is the Chief Quality Officer. He is going to be giving us a talk today that's gonna discuss how we improve culture and safety and quality uh, by focusing on both the technical and the social domains of improvement. And so uh, Lane's gonna talk to us about how uh, we can not only work on the tasks uh, and the processes that help us get our work done, but also uh, how we interact with one another and how that um, the social domain uh, combined with the technical can lead to uh, optimal or more optimal execution. Uh, for those that don't know Lane, he uh, is the Christopher Dawes Endowed Director of Quality at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and our Chief Quality Officer. Uh, and he's also the Associate Dean for Maternal and Child Health in the School of Medicine. Uh, Lane is one of the co-executive directors of the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement. Uh, and he is a professor of radiology and of pediatrics. Uh, uh, Lane has a uh, long career as an NIH funded researcher, has published over uh, 270 peer reviewed manuscripts, which have been cited an impressive 10,000 uh, times. Uh, and uh, if you're not a radiologist, you might not know, but he's also uh, the author of multiple radiology textbooks, including um, the leading uh, pediatric imaging fundamentals textbook. Lane has been part of uh, numerous uh, improvement projects that have received national recognition, particularly um, in uh, radiology, uh, and has served on both uh, the Board of Trustees for the American Board of Radiology and the Society for Pediatric Radiology. Uh, in case you were wondering, uh, he does like uh, beer. That's the preferred beverage uh, and has an excellent sense of humor and is a great photographer. So uh, with all that, uh, Lane, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Terry. Let me just share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? All right, great. Well, thank you, uh, Terry, very much for those uh, kind words and that kind introduction. I think it is important to disclose that the reason why I'm talking to you today uh, is that Lisa Friedman couldn't find anybody else to do it. So uh, I was the default uh, to speak uh, today. So uh, with that being said, I'm super happy to be here and super happy to talk to you. And as uh, Terry said, I'm gonna talk about the social and technical domains in creating a culture of uh, accelerated improvement. And I'd like to start with uh, calling attention uh, to the Lean Healthcare Academic Conference from Stanford. Uh, this is the sixth year this event will be held and it will occur on September 21st and 22nd. Uh, you didn't know, Terry, that you were gonna get a free plug uh, here for this, but the reason I'm starting with this is um, one of the main features of this meeting every year is a discussion or debate, uh, or it has been uh, each of the five years in the past uh, between Edgar Schein and uh, John Shook. And that's where I'd like to start uh, this, this story. Um, John, uh, for those of you who don't already know, uh, is, was the uh, first American uh, employee uh, for Toyota in Japan, and he helped introduce the Toyota production system at NUMI here in Fremont. Uh, and he's a lean expert. So, you know, John is a process guy. Uh, he obviously recognizes the important of, importance of culture in uh, achieving things, but you know, he's gonna come at things from, you need to concentrate on your process and use your process uh, to develop your, your culture. Edgar Schein, uh, on the other hand, uh, is uh, an MIT prefer, uh, uh, professor emeritus. Um, he lives here in Palo Alto, which is great for us because we get to see him. Um, he is essentially thought of as the father of organizational development uh, and uh, organizational culture. Uh, he's a sociologist uh, by background. And of course, he's going to come th at uh, things from the social side is the important thing that you have to work on your relationships and help uh, define your team, 
before you begin to worry about the processes. So each year at the Lean Academic Conference, uh, there is this often spirited debate, uh, uh, which is both um, great entertainment value and uh, very informative uh, between Edgar and John uh, about this topic, uh, which is the thing that you should concentrate on, your culture or your processes, which do you start with and how the, the two uh, relate together. And um, fortunately for myself, uh, two years ago, uh, we decided to frame this discussion in the form of a debate. And uh, John and I were on the process side, arguing that process was the important thing to concentrate on. And Edgar and Karen Fresh were on the social side, that the teamwork and social things were the important thing to concentrate on. And Lisa Freeman was the moderator for this. And then at the end, uh, everybody got to vote on which they thought was more important, social or process. We lost. Uh, the majority of the people said the social thing, which just uh, my takeaway was from, there are so many people out there who don't know what they're talking about. Just kidding. But anyway, um, after we had this presentation, I thought, gosh, we have these two incredible minds that have been talking about these things. It would be great if we could get them to agree to write some sort of article about this. And they were both enthusiastic about that. And that led to about an eight month process of us um, having these debates uh, through passing a manuscript back and forth. Uh, we had several in-person meetings when John happened to be in town. Uh, and we ended up with a about 10,000 word free form commentary on the importance of these things. Uh, and then it became the task to try to publish that in an actual journal. And for those of you who work on such things, you know, most journals uh, limit uh, commentaries at about a thousand words. So we had to make it a lot shorter. But the product from that was this agreement between Edgar and John that to optimize creating a culture of accelerated improvement. You have to think about the technical domain, which is the task processes and how the work is being done, as well as the social domain, how those doing the work interact. And to create an optimal execution, you have to have deliberate consideration of both of those things. And, and those two domains are gonna frame the next parts of what we're gonna discuss now. So. Let's start with the technical domain, how the work is done. So um, the argument on this side is that you can build your cultural expectations of how you want your leaders and team members to work into the processes so you can create the culture in that sense. You define your processes to shape your culture. And the benefits of thinking about it this way are that, you know, it is the work that is meaningful to the people that are doing the work, in our case, healthcare, taking care of patients. So if you can build these cultural expectations and how the work is done, you can uh, change the culture. The second thing is it's actionable. You know, if you were thinking, okay, let's change our culture. I think one of the problems is many people go, what do I do next? If you think about it from how do I define our processes, there's very actionable steps that you can take. So this is a, a list of various technical process type things about how we do our work that you can define to help shape your culture. Um, this is an incomplete list, but we'll go through some of these things and talk about how these processes and how you set them up can change your culture. First of all, uh, daily management systems or cured huddle processes. Um, uh, for me personally, I think, um, uh, I haven't seen anything change the culture of organizations as, the, as much as the implementation of daily management systems. You know, defining the standard work of how your leaders uh, lead through these processes uh, to define that your job is to make sure we're ready to take care of the patients that we're gonna take care of today, to identify problems, uh, to have those problems uh, go through a process whereby they, they're assigned an owner, uh, a completion date and a way that those problems are solved. All of those things, you know, how we recognize people each day are all super important and have a huge effect on your culture. Um, those uh, things are 
obviously changed from the pictures we saw on the last slide where people were standing together now uh, have uh, transferred into Zoom uh, ways to do it. And I think we've learned a lot about how to do that better. Uh, and, you know, as we go back out of um, the, the virtual world into a more mixed world, we're going to have to learn how to, where we need to go back to in-person things and where we continue to do Zoom things and how those things all interact. Uh, the second thing is um, in problem solving, having a defined way that you do that. And one of those ways uh, is uh, referred to by defining your aim using SMART goals. And as you're all aware, uh, SMART stands for goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Uh, people tend to leave the timely part off and define SMART goals a lot of the time rather than SMART goals. Uh, but this, if you put effort into this, helps you avoid uh, scope creep, define what you're working on, and keep to the timelines as best as possible. When we have um, groups report back on uh, prioritized initiatives, uh, we like to have them speak to one slide. Usually they have uh, this defined slide that's up in front of you, as well as their A3 if we have to refer to things but uh, for more detail. But we want to uh, be reminded of what their SMART goal is and if there's been any changes to their SMART goal, what their target completion date is, knowing that that could change. You know, you may run into things that you need something from IS, for example, and, and that slows down your timeline because you couldn't get prioritized the right way. Those things happen. Uh, you wanna know what their progress to plan is, uh, what the next major milestones are, and if they have any barriers uh, to what their um, uh, facing. So, you know, this is another way that you can define your processes to help uh, shape the culture of how you problem solve. And um, it has been successful. Uh, you know, we had to pull together uh, really large parts of the organization, uh, for example, to work on our collapse reduction initiative, use these approaches, and had a significant decrease. We have also found that uh, through working on uh, projects to reduce various different hacks that our key drivers tend to fall into the same buckets each time. So we've defined a process whereby we look at those buckets um, uh, for each project. You know, each project will have, is there standardization? Do things need to be further standardized or do those standards need to be modified? Um, is there data transparency? Yeah. Do people on the front line have the data to know whether do, they're doing well at a task or not? If they don't have that data, it's hard for them to improve. Is there accountability? Do the people uh, doing the work feel like they have ownership and responsibility to do it? And uh, particularly here at Stanford, coordination um, are all the people who are trying to improve a specific thing coordinated in their efforts. And if you look at this is um, a hospital acquired pressure injury uh, key driver diagram and these Key drivers here are very similar to those blocks that we just talked about. And just to look at one more example of a, a SMART goal, um, this one says by August 31st, 2019, we will decrease the SPS reportable happy rate uh, by 20% from X to X. So uh, very specific. Um, here is uh, another example of a process I think that we worked on that helps define our culture. In uh, 2017, uh, we had a very high number of serious safety events, and we had a very slow response to those events. Uh, if you look at two different time things on the left here is the different serious safety events and the length of time it took us from when we knew about the, the event to whether we determined it was a serious safety event. And you can see that some of those times are quite long, 127 days in, in this case. Uh, and um, we put a process in place with the goal of having that average under seven days and move that to uh, an average of approximately four days and have sustained that uh, since that period of time. Likewise, uh, the root cause analysis when there was a serious safety event took an average of something like 120 days. Um, so it could be up to half a year between when there was event and when you had a plan to prevent that action from happening again. And we uh, put a goal of having our average be under 30 days or all of them completed in 30 days and the average less than 30 days and have an average of about 26 days. So I think these two things 
um, gave it more of a sense of urgency around serious safety events and expressed um, that they were important and, and helped us be positioned to actually decrease uh, the number of serious safety events as well. Um, another example of where you can define your processes uh, to help shape your culture. Uh, regarding a professional practice evaluation, um, it is very important to have your the por portions of that that are aimed at improvement, what has become to be called peer learning, that when you review cases purely uh, for the goal of learning from those cases and improving your system, be completely sequestered from the other types of professional practice evaluation where individual provider competence is reviewed. And there are numerous things in that camp, uh, uh, ongoing professional practice evaluation, focused professional practice evaluation, the review of cases where someone's, uh, uh, an individual provider's specific clinical competence is questioned or their behavior. And the importance of keeping these things separate is that, you know, improving uh, and having peer learning is purely based on a culture of trust. And obviously on the other side, um, where someone individual provider competence is questioned and high stakes decisions might be made about that person, that completely erodes trust. Um, so a lot of organizations try to mix these two things together and that usually does not work. Um, at Packard, we've uh, created a system built on these principles where we have the professional practice evaluation committees that are purely related to improvement and those activities are separated and sequestered from all the ones related to individual provider competence. So again, a way of defining your processes to help shape uh, the culture you're trying to achieve. So we've now talked about a number of the things in the technical domain related to task processes and how the work is being done. Let's shift and talk about the social domain and how those doing the work interact. So there's a lot of things that we could talk about here that probably don't have time to touch on all of them, but uh, this is a short list of some of the things uh, that we can talk about. And well, you know, there's leadership techniques, um, high reliability tactics and training, team training, wellness efforts. And really the goal for all of these things is to create a culture of trust, uh, respect, and where people uh, feel comfortable uh, speaking out. So let's start with uh, leadership techniques. Uh, and it's interesting, if you look at almost any leadership related book, one of the things that they talk a lot about is being a good listener. Um, each of those books describes that very differently, uses different vocabulary, but uh, they're all basically saying the same thing. And in this book, which is a book called Anatomy of a Lean Leader by a guy named Jerry Bussell, who is from Jacksonville, Florida, he talks about that listening is really the key to respect, that it demonstrates empathy and it builds trust. And this is really the foundational skill of a good leader. Edgar Schein, who we've already talked about today, talks about many of these same things. His book, uh, Humble Inquiry, and many related books are excellent. Um, he talks about the gentle art of asking instead of telling. Uh, of drawing somebody out or asking questions to which you do not already know the answer, of building relationships based on curiosity and interest in the other person. And he also talks about that these things are super important because we very much have a, an innate culture of telling uh, where asking is seen as a sign of weakness and that our traditional thought about leadership is that we expect leaders to tell people what to do. Um, so this flies, obviously, in the face of that. And that really comes down to the concept of humility over arrogance. Um, humility enables learning, improvement, and a sense of team. And arrogance um, disables learning, improvement, and a sense of team as well. Another book that talks about many of the same things is this book called Accountability Now, Living the Ten Principles of Personal Leadership by a guy named Mark Sasser. And he talks a lot about uh, seeking first uh, to understand um, that, you know, everybody's individual personal thoughts and beliefs make sense to them. Uh, so you should curios curiously try to understand that person's perspective and where they're coming from. 
Um, he talks a lot about listening prior to judgment and prior to trying to exert influence on that person. And that is incredibly hard to do, uh, but uh, obviously very beneficial if you can do it. So those are some of the leadership stances on being a good listener. Um, there's also uh, error prevention training, um, the uh, Solutions for Patient Safety, which is the National Children's Hospital Safety Collaborative, has adopted the HPI um, approach to error prevention training. Uh, this is the packardized version of that, uh, which we refer to as Mission Zero. And it's been shown in uh, high risk um, industries that if you follow these type of error prevention strategies, that you can reduce human er error by a magnitude of a thousand. Uh, so if we all practice these types of things, our errors in communication will be greatly reduced. And you know, there are there are many things that you're familiar with, SBAR, um, standardized handoffs, ARC, which we'll talk about in a second, the name game. It's been shown that if you all introduce yourselves at the beginning of a uh, a handoff or a process that um, the that you're you'll be more successful than if not. So let's talk one second about ARC. Um, ARC is the Stanford Medicine Framework for Voicing Safety Concerns, and of course this is a, a defined pathway to help people escalate things only when escalation is needed. Uh, hopefully, most of the time uh, you don't use need to use ARC when you're communicating about something. But ARC stands for ask a question to the open the dialogue. Hey, did we do the timeout for this procedure? Request a change if that first part doesn't work. Um, hey, um, can we do the timeout for this procedure? I think we should before we start. And then if that doesn't work, voice your concern. I'm concerned that we're not doing the appropriate uh, timeouts before we start this surgical procedure. And then finally, if all those things uh, fail, um, use the chain of command and go to uh, the next person up in charge to, to voice your concern about what's going on. And one of the things that I love is this pin that they created on the SHC side, which we now also use on the children's side, which is an ARC pin, obviously. Uh, but at the top, it says, I will question, uh, which of course is the foundational thing uh, that ARC is trying to do to get people to feel, to give them a pathway and feel comfortable about speaking up, but at the bottom it says, I will welcome being questioned, which is obviously the other key part. All these communications are two-way street and we all have to welcome being questioned uh, when that comes up. And that can be obviously particularly challenging uh, on the physician side of things sometimes. So we all need to practice that. I saw a presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago from the folks at Cincinnati Children's and uh, this was their new program that they rolled out the past year or so uh, to improve psychological safety uh, in their organization. And they made this mandatory training for the entire 15,000 or however many employees they have now. And I thought there were a lot of really interesting things about it. So they uh, talk about that in order to successfully speak up, it's not just feeling comfortable speaking up, that there's a cognitive component to that, that you know when to speak up, that there's the uh, psychological or emotional part that they feel safe speaking up. And it's also that they're trained uh, to speak up, that they have the skills to speak up and listen up effectively. I love that phrase, listening up effectively. And then they talk about fostering an environment of trust, encouraging graceful and grateful responses and promoting constructive relationships. And you know, this is, I mean, this kind of summarizes what it's all about. And then they have these taglines that show up at the bottom of their, a lot of their documents now. It talks about uh, look out for yourself and others, speak up when you have a safety concern and listen with grace when concerns are raised by anyone and respond with gratitude. So I think it's a, a very interesting program. There are obviously many other approaches to teamwork. Uh, we have an, a teamwork advisory committee here that uses the team steps approach. And you know all of the things that you see on the right, there are obviously super important components uh, to having functional teams. 
I think that we will be challenged as we move out of COVID to the new hybrid world uh, in figuring out teamwork through a combination of what is still going to be Zoom, how often do we have to get in person to continue to have a, a strong feeling of team, and how do those things uh, work together. Uh, so that'll be uh, an interesting uh, development and one of the things that the, the upcoming Lean Conference will be focused on uh, in the fall. Um, wellness, obviously another uh, key part uh, to culture. Um, I think, you know, we are obviously out front as leaders here at Stanford in uh, discussing wellness, a culture of wellness, efficiency of practice, personal resilience, and how all that uh, relates to professional fulfillment. So um, with that, we have now talked about the technical domain, uh, the task processes and how the work is being done. We've talked about some of the aspects of the social domain, how those doing the work interact, and that it's to have optimal execution that it's, you need to have deliberate consideration of both. And I'd like to uh, close by just having a, a brief discussion of, of the area where I think those things are the most important and that paying attention to both sides of those things is, is essential. And that is in the area of managing complexity. Uh, we had a quality and safety grand rounds a couple months back and John Finkelstein, who's the chief quality officer of Boston Children's came and he talked a lot about this. So, you know, in quality and safety, we've looked to and learned a lot from the aviation um, industry. And, you know, they, uh, there's discussion that, you know, practicing medicine should look like a cockpit. We should have all our indicators and know what's happening, that we should have checklists um, to prepare ourselves uh, for these things, and that we should strive uh, to have zero errors uh, because obviously errors uh, can lead to problems. I think our, our challenge, uh, particularly at the children's hospital, but I think this is true at both our children's and our adult hospitals, is that our patient complexity is astronomical. Um, our case mix index has historically been the highest of any children's hospital in the United States. And that really relates to two things. One is we have these huge quaternary services. We're a medium-sized children's hospital with huge quaternary services. And second, with the way that referrals happen in this region, the community, simple kind of community sicknesses that cause kids to get admitted for don't come to us. You know, we don't see appendicitis and asthma exacerbation uh, and things like that at the rate that large children's hospitals do. So those two things together make us have this incredible high patient complexity. And that has only increased as you see in this graph uh, over uh, the pandemic. So our challenge is, you know, our ICUs are filled with these kids that are incredibly complex and on all kinds of uh, sometimes experimental, uh, sometimes um, last resort, life-saving, uh, technology. And if you look at our serious safety events, uh, overwhelmingly they occur in these sorts of circumstances. Uh, so it really is managing complexity and risk. And this is a, a typical one, kid in our ICUs, um, what their room looks like. This is a continuous renal replacement therapy machine, it's heater, all kinds of monitors and other devices in the room. And I would challenge anybody to say that this looks like a cockpit. You know, this does not look like an organized um, thing. And while probably each piece of this equipment and how to monitor the patient all do have standard work, and it's very important that they have standards and ways that we check on them each day and checklists to make sure that those things happening happen. When the caregivers and nurses walk into this room in the morning, I'm I'm sure that they're managing all of these things together does not seem like a checklist or a standard process to them. That, you know, um, it's a combination of a ton of standard processes. And of course, the fluctuation of the condition of the patient uh, dictates many things that have to happen and in the order that they happen in. And I think 
The other thing to think about is, is, is it realistic to think that people working in an environment like this are never going to make errors? And should it even be the way we um, think of our goals to try to prevent errors to zero? Um, or should we think of it another way? And this is uh, from an article in 2017 by Dr. Sutcliffe, who will actually be speaking to us in the series. Uh, she's from Johns Hopkins. And um, in thinking about managing complexity, I think it's very important that we think of the social and technical aspects of that. And on the technical side, all the things we've been talking about remain super important. Having standardized processes, having checklists, having error prevention techniques, having pre and post procedure debriefs, daily management systems, incident reporting, all of that. But on the social side, you know, taking care of these patients really comes down to having a culture of trust and listening, that the people involved in the care feel perfectly free to speak up, that maybe they don't think of that an error is never gonna happen, but that they anticipate that errors will happen and that we have processes in place to detect and contain those errors as quickly as possible. Um, we also don't expect these people uh, to blindly follow protocol, but to make timely adjustments uh, in how they're caring for these patients. And obviously this, sorry, this and these things are kind of at odds with each other, but we really expect both that people are gonna be able to take care of these super complicated patients. And uh, with that, I will stop. Um, thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. And I guess I'll turn it back over to Terry uh, to manage questions. This is the best thing ever. I get to talk in front of lots of people. Uh, thanks very much for that, Lane. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a great talk. Uh, and thanks also for all the uh, shout outs regarding the conference. It's been... Uh, that's that was very, very kind of you. But I, I do think that um, some of the stuff that uh, Edgar Schein and John Shook have shared over the years has been uh, really um, formative uh, for many of the people who've attended the conference. Uh, I am happy to open up the floor to questions that are um, uh, verbal. People can unmute themselves and ask a question or if someone wants to type something in the box as well. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, Lisa mentioned that uh, Dr. Sutcliffe will be speaking in this format on June the 27th. Uh, a familiar name popped up, so we'll start with uh, Dr. Ash. Uh, he has a question about how best to incorporate clinical prioritization into lean management. How do we avoid spending time on processes uh, for low priority events when they might interfere with improving more important ones? Terry, do you want to uh, take a shot at that first? I'm happy to respond as well, but you are our lean expert. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, yes. And then you can uh, correct anything I have to say, uh, although <laughs> Steve has probably heard enough of my voice over the years. But um, Steve, I think that uh, it, I, this is like sacrilege and I'm going to be recorded, but I'm going to say it anyways. Like I, I'm, you know, the guy working on lean improvement at Stanford Children's for 10 years and the notion of standard work drives me drives me nuts i i, I just like st standard work is just really really hard for me um i prefer the term agreed way of working and the reason why standard work drives me nuts is it 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 would be almost impossible for us to standardize absolutely every piece of work that we do um and i think that gets to the question that you're asking do I want to have a standard uh, or an agreed way to working about how we, you know, wash our hands or change a central line or hook up, you know, um, continuous renal replacement machine? The answer is yes. And the people that do those processes regularly have to know that. Um, but uh, when you start getting down to like, is there a standard, you know, for how we're going to, you know, sweep? Um, you just start to get into, um, you know, are you going to hold it this way? Should you not hold the room that way? Like there, there just gets to be like an over proliferation. So I, I think that um, uh, incorporating prioritization into you know, whatever management you're doing in particular lean is incredibly important. Uh, I think one of the fundamentals of improvement is no one wants to be improved to, right? So the, the notion of like an engineer coming or an improvement expert coming to a bunch of clinicians um, and saying, uh, hey, this is how you should do something. 
is it's kind of absurd, right? Uh, what it should be is, hey, we're, it looks like you guys are experiencing a problem. We have some tools, techniques, and the ability to support. Can we all work together to figure out from your, you know, knowledge, like what you think the greatest priorities are? And I'm going to flip it over to Lane, and then David uh, Larson's got a comment. But I think one of the things that Lane did was when he came here, he tried to really focus on how we're doing problem solving, uh, and how that it shouldn't be happening outside outside of where the work's being done, but rather in 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 where the work's being done. But Lane, I don't want to put words into your mouth on that, but perhaps you'd maybe expand on that and then we'll have David Larson has a comment. Sure. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve, I don't know if I'm going to get to your question or not, but uh, what the, my thought when you asked that question was around what Terry brought up related to prioritization. And I think, you know, uh, we've spent a lot of work on trying to figure out how we do that. We still have a long way to go, but we uh, you know, I think you have to think of prioritization as you have, get active polls for new things to work on and how those uh, are prioritized against the things that you're already working on. And um, we've come to kind of think of it as a low end prioritization and high end prioritization. So of all the things we're working on, and we usually do this through an annual planning process, what are the ones that really raise to the top and are the most important things to make sure that we get done during the next year? And uh, we have processes uh, to bring more visibility uh, to those um, uh, initiatives uh, to make sure that they're getting the attention and aid that they need. And then the low end prioritization, which I think we're worse at is, you know, what are the things we're getting asked to do that we just have to say no um, we're not going to be able to have the ability to do that. David, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, Lane, really fantastic talk. Um, we could spend hours on several of the points that you uh, highlighted, and I love how you distill things so clearly and, and succinctly and have maybe a few follow-ups, but I want to give others a chance to, to ask questions too. Um, but if it's okay, I'd like to uh, follow up on a point that Terry made um, and I really like, Terry, your uh, way of defining a standard. Uh, instead of standard work, you say an agreed way of working. And if I can maybe just drill on that just a little bit more, um, in, in my role, I've, I've taken on a role with uh, the American College of Radiology where I oversee the quality and safety efforts for the college. And a big part of my job now is developing standards that are now promulgated across the entire profession. And so it's my job is to help shepherd the development and application of these standards. Um, and so what I've really come to realize is there are multiple uh, definitions of a standard. And I think sometimes we get in trouble when we are not careful with the language. So I think the standards have at least kind of three basic definitions. Uh, first is just a description of how something is done, like a protocol, like just de define it. Just, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean anyone uses it or adopts it or, or agrees with it. It's just there, it's just written down, kind of the first step. Uh, and then second is, okay, now that a, this standard or proposed standard or way of working exists, that there's agreement on it, right? There's a process for, for going through and, and, and generating agreement. And then the third is, then there's an expectation around that. And there's an assignment, a kind of a normative type of uh, um, element to a science to say, okay, now that there is a defined way of doing things and we agree that it should be done, now it's applied. And so it's like a minimum standard, for example. So I think, you know, Terry, I love that, you know, the agreed way of working. And I think that we just need to be careful about how we think about that concept of standard. Thanks, David. Steve, I don't know if you have any more on there or if there's others that, well, Steve, if you had a follow up on that. Uh, no, just thank you. Oh. Um, uh, I think it's a very difficult problem and it's one that leadership uh, faces all the time. And that's why I was so interested in your perspectives on it, um, all three of you actually. Thanks, Steve. Any other uh, other questions? Yeah, hey, Bob Turbo Howard. That was a really great presentation, Lane. Thank you. You know, the, the analogy of the in the PICU, I just uh, the idea of sort of complex versus complicated. Each of the infusion pumps, the radiant warmer, the ventilator, complicated in their own right, but like Gleek's insight into chaos theory and actually become so complex that from any one starting point, you don't know where you're gonna end up. And I think, I do think our environment, you know, as Drucker has said, basically, you know, we have the most complex environment ever created by humans. And I think that the pick you example speaks to complexity versus complicated. 
Thanks, Bob. I completely agree. Thanks, Bob. Other comments, thoughts, questions? I was wondering, Lane, if you could say more about what has Packard done to address um, the uh, maybe overtly the issues of safety and speaking up. And you kind of touched on it's hard when someone wants to tell a physician that they have a concern and just, you know, I know that Packard's worked on that for years and years, but what strategies have been successful? Well, you know, I think it's a constant pathway. Uh, I think uh, they have, uh, we have made a lot of progress that mission zero uh, error prevention training things that I mentioned have been in place now, I think at least probably 10 years, something along those lines. And, um, you know, I obviously, I'm, I'm not sure what percentage of the our workforce is new since the original introduction of those, but it's probably the overwhelming majority. And uh, I think, you know, you constantly have to uh, pull those back out and reiterate them. Uh, the most recent uh, emphasis of ARC and, and sort of re-ARC training was uh, a big part of that. But I think in addition to the uh, tools, um, you know, talking to the importance of those things at, at any forum we have a chance to, uh, as well as uh, making sure that we talk about those sorts of things in our highest risk areas, which essentially are the ICUs and the perioperative area. Um, is uh, something that we need to do continuously. Thanks, Lane. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? Oh, great, David, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. I always have questions and, and <laughs> thoughts. So, um, so again, Lane, I, there's so many things that you touched on that I think you could spend a lot of time on. Um, one is the concept of maybe maybe I'll I'll say the kind of the narrow part, and I'd love to hear your thoughts maybe specifically on that, but also the larger perspective. Um, you know, I know we've been on this journey of, of peer learning for a long time, and it's really exciting to see now in the field of radiology, you know, this finally transforming, and, and it's been fun to be a partner with you in that, and to watch you know what's what's now actually happening. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, maybe how how do you you know, how, how does that unfold where you have kind of a transformation of perspective, right? That paradigm shift. Um, and if you have, you know, either recommendations or thoughts where if you've got a group of individuals or even a field as a whole who thinks a certain way, and there's a better way to think about it, like a lot of what you describe in leadership and other behaviors, kind of that process to how to get from here to there in a um, constructive way. Yeah, I mean, just for, uh, let me point out, David uh, uh, was referring to us working together on these things. I have to acknowledge my indebtment to all of the things that I've learned from David over the years, um, uh, particularly uh, in related to the concepts of how we can change peer review for the better to a concept of peer learning. And one of my favorite things to watch is uh, David uh, at our one of our annual meetings, the RSNA, he has a session where he reviews the um, uh, quality improvement reports uh, and basically evaluates uh, their aim essentially and how well defined it is. And I've learned a ton uh, about how to look at projects and see if they seem to be on track and are ac asking the right questions from watching him do that. So uh, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge that. But um, to your question, David, um, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, I'm not so sure. Well, obviously those processes are slow. Uh, and I think if you take the, the peer learning journey, uh, which has uh, kind of been a radiology thing as, as an example. And for those of you who are not familiar with the background, the American College of Radiology had this um, a numerical scoring of errors called Rad Peer, which was adopted by um, tens of thousands of radiologists uh, throughout the country, and it gave them a way to kind of keep track of how many errors there were, uh, and, um, but it didn't re result in any improvement or any learning, uh, nor was it really designed to, and it, uh, it's 
clear that it way underreported errors because no one wanted to like rat out their friends um, uh, related to that. And um, you know, David uh, uh, has helped us move to a concept of you know um, setting up a peer learning structure so that it's truly and purely focused on learning from those errors and from finding out what improvements to the system can be made related to those. And if you look at that, David, I mean, that really started in like, I don't know, 2008 or something like that. And, you know, picked up some, some momentum about a decade after that and really has now. So, you know, it's been like a 10 to 15 year process. Uh, so um, it takes a while. I don't know, what are your thoughts on the best way uh, to approach that from at least what we've learned from that particular example? Yeah, well, thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna also say, you know, um, Lane recruited me to Cincinnati Children's and was, was and continues to be a true example of a servant leader, um, someone who uh, you know, uses all of these attributes, adopts all these attributes that he advocates. And so you know, the support that we all received there was tremendous. Um, yeah, I think the, you know, well, and I'll say specifically on that, I remember when we went to the committee, first of all, you know, I talked, we had this conversation about here's we want to completely redo this and you're like, okay, and we went and we proposed it at the time I didn't realize like how much, you know, political capital you had to spend and as a leader had to like go and say we're going to re redo this whole thing. Um, but it was in a relatively confined area and um, they gave us the benefit of the doubt and is just then we then it worked and we tried it and we made adjustments and I think that one by one as people see you know that there's a better way of doing this um, that you know it it can tip the field right that you can I think you you really illustrated that really well just patience and get one ally after another and then pretty soon um, this type of behavior becomes the norm and even when it feels like you know when you're it's not going anywhere it feels like the culture is not great. Just like what you've talked about with Ed, you know, to define the behavior that you want, and this is one after another. Eventually, it'll get there. I think we'll try and see. If we can get one more question. Maybe we can get into. Uh, James asked a question, Lane, um, that you mentioned that IS is a potential bottleneck for getting data to understand what's going on. How do we bake in the real-time data analytics for people at the front line, not just the managers? so that we can get to a true learning health system to, to see if we have uh, interventions that uh, improve so we can get to a learning health system. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge challenge. I may not probably be the best person on this entire call to answer that question, but I'll, I'll take a shot. Um, you know, I think that, um, I think things have improved over time with um, our ability to get uh, appropriate data back to those who need it. Um, we have unit dashboards now that you know, each of the units can look and see what their uh, individual collapse rate is, their uh, compliance with uh, bundle elements, uh, similar with pressure injuries and other things. Uh, so I do think things are much better than they were even three or four years ago. Um, you know, uh, I think other key elements that at least the, the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement groups are working on is uh, you know, creating uh, an ease of pathway for people who want data to get to the right people uh, to be able to ask those questions. I think obviously there's an element there also of um, data literacy and educating people so that they understand um, what data might actually be helpful for them and what data might not uh, to streamline what is being requested. So I, I think that's a there's a, a lot of components to that one. And Lane, to test your speed answers, this will be the last question, then we'll, we'll go on. But Bob Turbo asked one that's really uh, been recently brought up again, the question of zero uh, being uh, a goal for improvement. Uh, you know, uh, uh, just basically paraphrasing Bob, the, the technical into the social, uh, is zero an appropriate SMART goal? Uh, and I think that's interesting, right? When you're talking about smart goals, is, is that appropriate? Lots of discussion, but you'll have uh, the last word to send us on our way thinking. Right? Yeah, I think there's two, at least two parts to that. One is uh, for goals. And, you know, as you know, Terry, from our annual goal deployment process, we never pick zero as the goal. I mean, it's always some iteration uh, compared to where we are now, compared to what we 
how much, what percent we hope to improve by the next year. So in that sense, I, I don't think it's a, a realistic goal. From a mindset standpoint, and to me, this is more of the debate, um, is it a healthy mindset to have that our ultimate long range goal is to get to zero errors? And I think that's where the question is, is that even a healthy thing to have or should we uh, change our mindset to um, errors are gonna happen, uh, we're never gonna get to zero. And although we wanna error proof things as best as possible and minimal, minimize every error we can, um, a big part of our, our mindset should be that some errors are still gonna ha happen, particularly in these very complex situations and that we need to think about how do we most rapidly identify uh, them and put countermeasures in place as quickly as possible when they do occur to try to prevent harm? For anyone that wants to debate that subject more, um, I also like uh, beer and happy to continue on that after hours. It's uh, so great to see everybody I, uh, on that same vein. I, I do hope that in the next year, we get to have some of these in person. Uh, Steve, it's been too long. Uh, I get love to look people in the eyes, but it, it has been a great to have uh, everyone be able to come together, even though we may be uh, distant uh, in forums like this. Thank you all for joining. Uh, please do, if you have not already, sign up for the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement, uh, becoming an affiliate or a fellow. And uh, we look forward to many more of these uh, uh, sessions uh, as we go forward. Lisa, anything before we go? Uh, no, I, I did put in the chat too, if you're an affiliate or a uh, fellow, you got a data survey yesterday. And if you did not get that survey and you want to fill it out, I put my email in the chat and I'll happy to send it to you. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, Lane. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Keep improving. Thank you. Stay healthy.